can't have. Now listen, you the right writer. Stop calling here. me a crypto Nazi. Let's, let's stop or calling I'll names you in your get... goddamn face, and let's... you'll stay plastered. <laughs> Would you call God material or immaterial? Immaterial. What is something that's immaterial? Something not extended in space. Can you give me an example of anything other than God that's immaterial? Lost logic. <laughs> Yeah. educational system is going to fail you. Well, I graduated from college believing exactly as you believe. Yep. All right, here we go. 40 on Hemlock Podcast, episode 31. And drop the beat. Ladies and gentlemen, really excited to be back. I mean, technically last episode was the really, really excited to be back, but I continue to be excited to be back um so we got to get right to it because we closed last show on a a point of narrative a point of a story a point of an account and i got to keep going with it right all right who am i what am i i'm just a guy with uh not enough hours in the day to avoid saying what i want to say although i'm not entirely sure what i've said there we got to move on from the expansion on jack's story in last episode I guess we can't really do that till the music fades out, but we have to do that because we got to see uh, the things that um, Jack's story sort of illustrates. We got to see them on a larger scale. I mean, uh, should I just fade this out? I'm sorry. Hang on one second. No, oh, it's fading out. Of course, as soon as I go to fade it out, it's fading out, isn't it? All right, listen. I brought back Jack. Please fade it out. Oh, it's be- is it because I haven't done a uh, Fife Dog yet? Is that what it is? <laughs> All right. As we talk, as, as we take up, as we up the ante, as we as we throttle it a little bit here and move from sort of a, a recount of Jack's story to the larger application. Fife Dog, if you were in my shoes and you had the tall task that I have in this episode of talking through this stuff in a way that is like, conveys the importance that... I think it has, but at the same time is is listenable. Fife Dog, how would you approach it? How, how just in general, Fife, how do you approach things? When the mic is in my hand, I'm never hesitant. It's like no matter how many times I hear it, it's just good advice. I can't. What am I gonna say? It's good. Good advice is good advice, right? All right. So we're not gonna hesitate. Um, I brought back Jack because I want it to be really clear how. Uh, like I think I said at the end last time, how these two sides, these two different sides of the story that we've really been keeping separate since the beginning, how they are, I mean, I don't want to put this point too strongly, but how they're the same. Or, or I guess more, more minimally or more conservatively, you might say one is constituted by the other, one's motivated by the other. Um, don't Just bear with me. I'll explain what I mean here. Uh, I mean, what it is that the psychological story may end up explaining is perhaps the otherwise inexplicable theoretical story. Do you see? Going back several, several episodes, all the way back to all the best basketball players from Norway, how do you, get, how do you, how do you account for the motivation of the guy on stage who you're having this sort of like brick wall uh, interaction with where you just, cannot, you just cannot make sense of the fact that this guy cannot see? That what he's offering as evidence is only evidence within the context of the theory he's offering evidence in, right? So it's just circular. It's just, it's just a tautology. All the best basketball play- players are from Norway because any, bas- any basketball player I see, I declare is Norwegian. It's just running roughshod over the facts. All the events of human history are instances of this oppression that Marx cites, right? It's just running roughshod over the facts because what's the evidence for? There's no real evidence for it. You just point to any instance of human social history and you say, well, here is the oppression in that. Do you see so this is what I mean by the two sides of the coin converging, because you need some account of that sort of uh, rational obstinance, I guess. Is that a good way to put it? I don't know. There's probably better ways, but that, seemed, that seems to do it a little bit. You need an account of that. What's motivating that? In a sense, you're psychologizing, but it doesn't follow from the fact that there are cases of psychologizing that are fallacious, that psychologizing is not a necessary thing to do when you run into a rational wall like this. What is motivating the irrationality is not a fallacious question. Do you see? Really, I, you, you, you philosophy students out there really appreciate that. I mean, what if when we turn 
to where radicalism made its way into, let's see, academic culture, you know, hence the show. (laughs) What if what we see when we do that is that we just see a bunch of, like I said last time, grown up jacks, tenure track jacks, whose, whose only impulse is to what? Tear down, tear down, tear down. Like, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, this, I know this is, I know this is recent. It's too soon. It will always be too soon. But like the, like the Austin bomber said in, in his writing to, to watch the world burn. Not unlike, well, I, I think as you'll see in a minute, a few other, yeah, I think you will see in a minute. A few other folks have said on paper, luminaries in the field <laughs> that this tendency of thought and sort of intellectual style that we're going to discuss here comes from. What if what is dressed up in this intellectualized garb really just turns out to be a mechanism or or mechanisms to accomplish the same tearing down, but in a more subtle way? I know we did the history thing before um, where we sort of discussed like the, the, what was sort of historical and linguistic, right? Because we talked about the history of this group in Germany and that the original purpose of the name was to sort of conceal this sort of logical trick, to sort, of like a, sort of like a sleight of hand with the name, you know, right? To, to, to define yourself negatively, Antifa, anti-fascist, is to implicitly assert that any opponent of yours is in fact a fascist. It's very clever. It's linguistic. Keep that in mind. It's linguistic. It's at the level of language. Really keep that in mind as we go forward. You'll see why in a minute. All right. So we did that sort of history thing, and we keyed in on the 19, what, 1930s Germany, Hitler's election. Well, right after that, there's something to note, too. When Hitler starts rounding up you know, Jewish people and, and Christians and other groups and doing just the, you know, the unspeakable things that, he's, that he does to these millions of people, well, naturally, some people are able to flee the country and others aren't. Right. Um, as this like just wave of, I mean, I don't know what you want to call it, satanic. Or what did Han- what did uh, what did Hannah Arendt call it? Um, banal evil as, as this sweeps over Germany. Um, some of the folks, some of the Jewish folks in Germany uh, were communists, arguably not a not a huge not a huge subsection of them, but, but definitely some. And, and I mean, just try to, put, <laughs> this is, man, I don't know. Just try to put yourself in that position. You've just been, according to your polit- political allegiances, you know, you've just been instructed by your party to vote for this party, the Nazis. Then they come into power, and now the leader, Hitler, ultimately what ends up happening is this guy ends up rounding your people of, a, you know, one of the other groups you belong to, it's just rounding them up to have them, gassed and all the, like I said, all the atrocious things. I don't talk about it, right? So here you just elected this guy. Anyways, so some, like I said a moment ago, some people are able to escape, some aren't. Of the group of folks that were able to make their way, you know, targets of Hitler, that were able to make their way out of Germany before being rounded up, some are academics. And at the time, there was a group meeting uh, in the city of Frankfurt, if I understand it right, pretty briefly prior to the onset of these events, but nonetheless, we're meeting because they were all of a sort of a similar academic bent and we're doing some work together and formulating some ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And they come to be known as the Frankfurt School. Okay. They escape. All right. They escape. And they make their way um, to America. Okay. Now, the reason I'm citing, and it's not, to be to be honest, it's not just a uh, the ideas that we're ultimately going to focus on don't just come from these guys. There's, there's some Italian guys and there's some French guys as well. We'll mention them. In fact, one of the French guys is very important. Um, but in large measure, this particular group that escapes Hitler's Germany is responsible for a huge amount of what we want to talk about here. So these guys come to America. All right. And they are embraced um, by several high-level, high-tier, Ivy-ish and Ivy League institutions in America, okay, immediately. And, they, and, and, and so they take up positions. They get, you know, their grants and their funding. Or, you know, they, they get positions back there so they can work. They can produce intellectual output. And what they get to work producing, I'm going to argue compellingly and convincingly, <laughs> all right, is 
is is again I'll, I'll use the word intellectual output that is that is designed in its very nature. Now listen, here's the thing: to destroy the country that had just embraced them as they fled this murderous, insane, tyrannical zealot. I mean, okay, do you see? Now you might think, well, that's pre- that's a pretty strong claim. Why would anybody do that? Okay, fine. That's that's fine. Um, that's a good that's a good question. But you have to understand in in, in embracing for the answer, you gotta understand that these guys are coming from a tradition, an academic, like an intellectual tradition in Europe. The forefathers of which are uh, philosophers like like Martin Heidegger, now a German guy. Of course, later on, Heidegger becomes a member of the Nazi party. And so, you know, in hindsight, it's not like these guys are going to claim Heidegger as a forefather. You know, they're Jews fleeing Hitler, right? But if you abstract away from those particular sort of like uh, team aspects, I hate to call it that, but like group aspects, it's undeniable from a purely sort of ideal point of view, like the content of the ideas and the nature of the ideas. It's undeniable that prior to um, his involvement with the Nazi party, he's, he's, a, he's a philosophical granddaddy of the ideas that we're discussing here that these guys bring to America. Okay. Um, Heidegger is a very frustrated and angry man. You might think that's presumptuous. I didn't know the guy. Right? You might think that's presumptuous to say, right? But uh, um, he's a, he's a, I mean, it's to say, look, I'm a curmudgeon. I don't want to just call the guy a curmudgeon. I'm a curmudgeon. And I'm like, uh, well, listen, as, as he says, he longs for the day when, um, Quote, the spiritual strength of the West fails. The West means America, right? And what it represents. The spiritual strength of the West fails and its joints crack. America is incidentally where you live, by the way, if you're listening to this, for the most part, right? You know, my my main audience, right? He longs for the day when where you live and, and thrive and have your family and are invested and where you're free to, right? He longs for the day where where you live fails, and its joints crack when the, he says, when the moribund semblance of culture caves in and drags, listen to this language, all forces into confusion and lets them suffocate in madness, end quote. But I would really emphasize confusion, suffocation, and madness. All right. Just a just sort of a promissory note for later in the talk, later in the discussion, later in the podcast. This guy is a this guy is a mentor to one of the guys that would go on to become basically the 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 MVP, the most valuable player of this team. Again, for you know, t- as a metaphor, of academics that were um, that we're talking about here, the Frankfurt School. This is really. Um, is, do I say this too much? It's really important to understand their contribution um, to the, the world of ideas that surrounds you at this very moment. Now, the interesting thing about this, I thought we were almost due for a break there. The interesting thing about this contribution is that it's not a contribution, intellectual contribution in the sense that you might think. Here's what I mean by that. It's not some positive propositional content. Stop talking like a philosopher, Nick. It's not some like statement of fact about anything or set of facts about anything that is their contribution. It's a technique, you might say. It's a method that they introduced and op- you know, popularized and operated with, a sort of like way of proceeding, a sort of outlook from which one starts one's intellectual endeavor. This is really, well, I almost said it again. I'm sorry. It's, it's that that's going to interest us here. And I think you'll see why shortly. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about these guys in sort of like three strands or three threads. We're going to look at three things. Uh, so the contribution that they made, this, this method I'm talking about one, two, one is more general, but two more, some particular strategies that they deployed within that framework, strategies that are designed to, as I said a moment ago, as I introduced them, and and tie them to Jack, tear down, tear down, tear down strategies that are designed to tear down American society and usher in Marxism. 
But because they're doing it intellectually, as opposed to like by force in the streets, this is Marxism ushered in through the back door, so to speak. Okay, so that's two. Three, we're going to just see where the sort of uh, residual or the trails of those ideas have sort of spread and seeped to, right? Okay, so that's like that's kind of like the approach here. That's that's the that's the three part agenda. Okay, and again, all of that I want I want you to hear this is we, we should be thinking about in terms of um, all of these three things we're going to be talking about. I, I want to be clear. We got to understand in light of this thing I said earlier about. The coin, the two sides of the coin converging. These two stories that we've been telling, these two parts of radicalism, these two components of any you know significant discussion of what radicalism is: the psychological side and the theoretical side. I'm now saying they converge, and and to see these three threads that we're going to see and expand on, I I, I want you to understand what we're going to say here in light of my statement that these things converge and one explains the other. Okay, it's really important to see this. <laughs> oh, I said it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um. The two sides of the coin converge. I just can't say it enough. Okay, look. Uh, what if what masquerades as a theoretical turns out to just be the personal or the psychological in the end? What if the professors are just tenure track jacks? What would that mean? Would that mean that the theoretical stuff was just smokescreen, meant to you know diffuse or divert or distract from what was essentially an animosity towards? Uh, ideas in any way related to, you know, religion, like Marx said, or traditional ideas. Because remember, that's what sets Jack off. I, I know Jack's a particular Jack's a particular case, but when you start to hear these people talking, you'll be like, wow, Jack's, Jack's going around. Now, as context, just think about World War I for a minute. What do we get with World War I? You don't get, across Europe, this sort of like... Uh, conflagration of proletariat, you know, working class, blue collar unification and, um, you know, uh, solidarity and applied force to the structures of power as they, you know, you don't get that. You don't get this revolution that Marx is talking about. Okay. I mean, Europe just exploded in a world war and everybody's at each other's throats and it's brutal and it's awful and it's catastrophic. Right. And it's like, it's not, it's, it's anything but a unification, like Marx said, to be workers of the world unite. They were not uniting, right? Um, so if Marx has a, like a profit status among his followers and communist colleagues, if, he, if he's got this status, there might now be some suspicion or some worry that he was wrong or mistaken or confused or a false prophet. You know, it's not working out like he predicted, okay? Um. So these guys that we're going to discuss tonight do something very clever with this fact in order to cons- continue in their Marxist belief despite how things had panned out historically as compared to how Marx predicted they would pan out. So what they did is they just reinterpreted Marx's ideas and then reapplied them. Um, so what do I mean they reinterpreted? Well, they just decided that what was really important about Marx was, was the outcome rather than how that outcome came about. You know, so, okay, so Marx was wrong that this whole revolutionary fervor and whatever is going to unfold among the working classes, you know, and breathlessly usher in this revolution and, and, and the, the classless, you know, utopian society. They're like, fine, okay, but look, what's really important was that we nonetheless arrive at that outcome that Marx described, this communism, this, this classless society, this dictatorship of the proletariat. So rather than view Marx as a a book of prophecy, they sort of translate it into an instruction book. It's sort of like a manual now. All right. And then once, when you see that, then you can understand this other half. All right. And by this other half, I mean these three points that we're going to discuss, like these implementations of the larger idea. Okay. How these guys translated Marx's ideas into this instructional program for bringing about this global communist revolution. It's ingenious, it's hideous, and it's at the level of idea rather than at the level of sort of like clashes with bats and guns and knives and torches in the streets, okay? Um, so three threads. I know, so that was a lot of uh, prelude and preface and, inter- and you know, and prescript or I don't know what you call it, introduction, summary. Um, first, the main contribution, then the strategies that were implemented, and then finally, uh, where these ideas have spread to, okay? Just remember what I said about 
uh, how we're going to encounter that these two sides of the, of the coin converge, okay? We just revisited Jack, and we saw the evolution of his thinking in the last episode. And this point of view that's been developing in his mind after walking away from the, re sort of the religious framework he grew up with. And it's really important now to see the same evolution reflected in the theoretical part of the picture, okay? Because these guys that escaped Hitler, <laughs> these academics, this Frankfurt School, and, and, and their counterparts still on the continent in Europe and, and in France and Italy. But these guys, um, they come to America, like we said, and initially to, to uh, incidentally, University of Chicago, Columbia University in New York. <laughs> um, notice any recent historical figures that have significant ties to those institutions? All right, whatever. Ignore it. I'm just saying. You'll, you'll see later. Um, they come there and they immediately set about to, to, to like angle their position as academics in these various fields. Philosophy, English, sociology, history, things like that. To launch an attack on America and on the philosophical basis on which America is, you know, by, the way, by way of its sort of like founding documents, founded. Um, it, it, now look, look. We've, we've expressed some surprise earlier that they would do this, given sort of the fact that this was their sort of sanctuary or respite from what was going on over there. But should it really surprise you now? Think about this. Should it really surprise you now that they did this? I mean, should it? Given what we discovered towards the end of episode 29, that there is sort of like a fundamental level on which these two superficially disagreeing factions agree. Now, when we come to this point, should it really surprise you? When you get down to it, you think about it. Um, that these guys would do this when they got here. We saw in the, that episode that the fascism that they were escaping, the Nazism, which is a form of fascism, and the communism they themselves advocated for actually are quite comfortable with one another because those two political philosophies agree on the most basic question of political philosophy itself, the individual person's relation to the state. They agree that the individual counts for nothing is not fundamental, is not primary, but rather is contingent, derivative, secondary, and the state is primary. The state is fundamental. The state is the fundamental unit of rights and purpose and meaning and all this. Okay? The state is everything. Okay? So they actually agree on a deeper level with the very philosophy that ended up in, resulting in creating some conditions that, res that necessitated them fleeing. But their true enemy, the enemy they share with that philosophy, is now, you know, born on the shores that they've landed. Okay? So they made their academic careers out of creating a, I hesitate to call it philosophy. It doesn't deserve that name. It's, I don't know what it is. The point being, they did what they did by creating a style of theorizing that was designed to undermine fundamentally everything America stood for. Now, remember when we were talking about Jack earlier and the, the adventure in hypercriticism, and I said, focus on this word criticism. They called the style of theorizing critical theory. And it really is not all that different in some, in total, in the, en in the end, than what we saw Jack doing once his sort of mind took this turn. But it is now applied rigorously and with, with, great, uh, with great hideous creativity and breadth okay so so this is what we're going to look at here but we got to take a break man because we've been going here so we'll be right back i'm going to get a drink and then we'll get into what these guys did my name is nick it's the 40 ounce hemlock podcast we'll be right back are listening to the 40 ounce hemlock podcast the antidote to academic poison we're getting near the end of our series unmasking antifa in which this is part 11 and today's discussion is called tenure track jacks aside from that we're thrilled that you're here with us listening we're honored to have you and we're excited to show you where this story is headed as we get closer and closer episode by episode to taking the mask off of antifa so let's get back to it 
recognizing a communist, physical appearance counts for nothing. If he openly declares himself to be a communist, we take his word for it. If a person consistently reads and advocates the views expressed in a communist publication, he may be a communist. If a person supports organizations which reflect communist teachings, or organizations labeled communist by the Department of Justice, she may be a communist. If a person defends the activities of communist nations while consistently attacking the domestic and foreign policy of the United States, she may be a communist. If a person does all these things over a period of time, he must be a communist. But there are other communists who don't show their real faces, who work more silently. All right, we're back. Um, I'm admittedly a little bit nervous because I've kind of, I feel like I've set myself up here. I've, I got a tall task in front of me because we're going to dig here. We're going to get into the thinking of, of these guys that I've been talking about. Um, we got to get into this. And I know I've been uh, stressing this emphasis, emphasizing <laughs> this emphasis um, on this idea of criticism. And uh, I, I've said now just before the break that the, the style of thinking, the philosophy, uh, the methodology, whatever you want to call it, that these guys advanced came to be called critical theory. Now, I got to explain what that is and then we got to get into it, okay? I think, well, here's, here's, here's possibly a, a, the best way to understand this. Up to this point in time, in philosophy and other fields, when you evaluated something, when you an analyzed something, when you theoretically assessed something, whatever, any something, some piece of art, uh, some production of industry, some discovery of science, some proposal of legal change or reform or, or policy or some account of a historical event or person uh, or some piece of music or some work of fiction or some anything, you see, anything to which you might turn your mind and analyze and assess, any of this, all of it, the doing so, the analysis, the evaluation involved involves, just has to, in the nature of the case, by, by virtue of just what it is you're doing, involves uh, judging that thing, or parts of it, or aspects of it, properties of it, or both, um, against some generally acknowledged standard or standards. Okay, look, think of like sculpture. Why is it, I'm going to trip through this, but we'll, I'll do it fast, and I think it will at least be partially useful. Why, why is it that the Greek sculptors, you know, are so highly regarded, the ancient Greek, sculpt Greek sculptors? Well, you know, if we had to hazard a sort of answer to that, or if we had to just think through that, it, we'd say something like, well, look, it's because the standards that just naturally, you know, emanate from or, or, or flow from factors like, oh, the difficulty of carving anything, you know, let alone anything from stone, uh, also, you know, combined with, well, Look, the, the particular aesthetic and functional nuance and, and ingenuity and beauty and intricacy of the human form, all, all these things sort of combine to force you to acknowledge a, a level of skill as, as evidenced by, you know, a, a degree of excellence in the creation, the sculpture. Well, what's that excellence? Well, that excellence is a product of a standard applied to a fact. The fact, you know, for, for, for lack of a better term, is the statue. It's the thing. But the standard is not the thing. It's not in the thing, right? It's not the thing. The, it's what, the standard is the thing that seems to dictate that some efforts at, in our example, stone sculpting, you know, produce, you know, more impressive results than others. And, and that there is a sort of a degree of difficulty concept at play here, right? I mean, the obvious goal of, in some accurate way, capturing the human form with a chisel and a hammer and rock, you know, just has the consequence that attempts to capture it will be considered more excellent to the extent that they capture the object that they're trying to capture. The thing, the fact, sets the standard, 
and the standard explains the value of the thing, or the standard is the basis on which the value or the excellence or the goodness of the thing is assessed. Um, to evaluate something meaningfully is impossible if the, if the standards, if the values on which that evaluation hinges, on which it's based, are actually just, you know, subjective whims or conditioned fabrications, you know, as Marx said they were, see? So if there are no standards in the sense that there need to be standards for evaluation to take place, then here's the question. Here's um, the core question. I hope I don't say that again because then you're going to be like, well, which one is the core question? Here's the core question. If that's the case, then what is it that someone is doing when they're doing what we had previously thought was, you know, theoretical assessment or evaluation, right? Or analysis on the basis of, of real knowable principles. If there are no real knowable principles, like Marx said, then what are we doing when we do that? And the answer to that question, uh, I'm submitting to you, I'm proposing to you, the answer to that question gets at the heart of, if you can appreciate it, what critical theory is. I mean, this is essentially the, the question that critical theory sets out to answer and then promote the answer to, okay? And if you want to see what the answer is going to be, and you're going to see it in a second, but just, I mean, just think about Marx. What would Marx say to that question. If we said, well, then what are we doing when we evaluate something? What's he going to say? He's going to say that what you're actually doing is applying, you know, values, principles, standards, etc. that are what? Just a production of your group, your social class. And thus, they're meant to reinforce the status quo and your power within that system. Or, or perhaps, like they say now, it's meant to promote and preserve, um, you know, because they keep softening the message while they're getting more violent. Isn't that interesting? They're softening the message while they get more violent. They're going to say, these days, they're going to say, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're just reinforcing a status quo or your privilege. See, that's the word now, privilege. But it means the same thing, okay? Do you follow that? So excellence when we talk about excellence in something, it's just a descriptive word that's meant to refer to or illustrate or denote or call out success in meeting or closely meeting or approximating or headed in the, heading in the direction of a standard, a standard that's desirable for some valid reason, right? There's standards of evil too, but we don't call a thing excellent if it's approaching those standards. We call a thing excellent if it's approaching desirable standards, right? The whole point of critical theory is to say this. Ready? Ah, but there are no valid reasons because there are no such standards. Do you see that? Excellence is just meant to refer to, and excellence just refers to the success in a meeting, a standard that is desirable for a valid reason, and critical theory says no. Maybe so, but there are no valid reasons because there are no such standards. So, now, here comes the conclusion, the inference, the, the upshot, as they call it. So, they say, everywhere such standards are being invoked, spoiler alert, everywhere, all day, every day, heretofore in history, in every field, in every inquiry, in every, I mean, everywhere such standards are being invoked, are you ready? Oppression is actually happening. Are you noticing some recurrent themes here? I told you we're going to see a sort of merging or a melding of the psychological and the theoretical, and we're going to almost see Jack now grown up, you know, putting forth a theory called critical theory. Everywhere such standards are being invoked, oppression is actually happening. Everywhere that Jack looks, he sees deception. Everywhere there's excellence, Jack sees oppression. Excellence. See, for some reason... Now, I, I'm, I'm being a little bit cheeky or whatever they, whatever they call it, you know, when I say that. For some reason, think back to the story, Jack has come to hate the possibility of the reality, and by reality, I mean the realness of the standard. Why is that? Why has he suddenly come to hate the idea that there are objective, real standards that people are bound to? Hmm. Why does he hate that? 
well, put that aside for a minute or maybe think about it or maybe, already, maybe you've already figured it out. He hates excellence. So he seeks to dethrone it. He seeks to uproot it. He seeks to tear it down. He seeks to criticize it. All right? He seeks to find a way to explain it away, to show that it's not really excellence. And how, how would Marx do that? Marx would say, well, the standards by which you're judging it excellent are a tool of oppression. So you're really only reinforcing your power by saying that. All right? This is exactly what critical theory sets out to do with anything and everything. D- Derrida was a Marxist to begin with, but that fell out of favor because it turned out that Marxist political doctrine kept producing evil empires and even radical left French intellectuals were forced to admit that by the mid-1970s. You know, they'd put their head in in the sand for 20 years, 50 years really, uh, thoroughly in the sand and made sure their ears were full too. But by the mid-1970s, the evidence that that was the case was so overwhelming that even a French intellectual couldn't deny it anymore. And so they started to play sleight of hand with the Marxist ideas. So instead of trying to promote the revolution of the working class against the, uh, against the capitalist class, let's say, they started to play identity politics and said, well, we can just separate everybody into oppressed versus oppressor, but we don't have to do it on economic grounds. And, so we, and we can call it power instead of economic. You see, I hope, it's, I hope it's clear now why I said that the best way to understand critical theory is to see that this is essentially, this is essentially Marx applied to you know, intellectual discourse. See how Marx tells you, remember, Marx tells you that the standard that you've always assumed was real, unchanging, eternal, objective, etc., is actually just like a, 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 a yoke that's been placed around your neck for your enslavement. Well, here come the critical theorists, these guys, the Frankfurt School, you know, and the others that I mentioned from the continent, from Europe. They come along and they're like, yeah, well then, that's true everywhere. Everywhere a standard is assumed or asserted, it must be destroyed. For it must, in the nature of the case, if Marx is right, notice it begins with the assumption that if Marx is right, it must, in the nature of the case, the standard, be or or, or represent an utterly arbitrary oppression. It has to be arbitrary because it can't be grounded in anything eternal or abiding or unchanging or objective or invariant. You see, it's just one group imposing themselves on another to dominate them, to extort them, to, like Marx said, alienate them, to, to, right, to um, exploit them. Marx also used ex- the word exploit a lot. I mean, how could any one standard be better than another? It can't on Marx's view. So if it can't, then that's all this could be. And then that, as, like we said, then that's all assessing something is, is judging it on the basis of your oppressive standards. So nothing can be assessed or criticized really and this is one of the great ironies of critical theory is that the, I mean, the co- logical consequence of it is that nothing can be meaningfully criticized. And yet the entire, the entire game of critical theory is to criticize everything. A- a- and I guess suppose that it's meaningful somehow. All right. So these guys, um, they, they, they change the very endeavor, the very nature uh, of academic inquiry, the very practice of, of intellectual inquiry and discussion. It's not, it's not what it used to be before them. In their hands, it changes, not, not peripherally, centrally, fundamentally. It now consists for them in simply, and if you've been, listen, if you've been through a college course or two where the, re, where the readings are of this nature, you're going to know what I mean by this. And if you haven't, well, I, I, hope, you, I hope you sort of gather it anyways. What academic inquiry and discussion now consists in, I, God, I pray some folks who've been in these classes are listening because you're going to be like, uh, yeah. What, what, it, what it is now is just, it's just scouring any and every subject under discussion for the assumed values on which that discussion is taking place and then asserting the, you know, quote, constructed nature of those values and, and thus, by extension, the upshot, the unjust oppressive effects of that way of thinking. Um, do you see? This is just Marxism applied to thought, applied to, you know, intellectual exchange and discourse. So, 
I think I, I think I began all this by saying, what do I mean when I say they set out to undermine America, you know, in, in their style of theorizing? So these guys, what they set out to do, and what they do is they infiltrate academia and every discussion of every subject in academia, and they start applying this method, this methodology. Um, I don't know if this is necessary to say. I mean, look, a moment ago, I used the phrase, I think I started out here by saying that, you know, the easiest way to understand critical theory is dot, dot, dot. But I got to just make sure you understand what I'm saying when I say that. I got I to gotta just note something really important about a statement like that, because the truth is, and, and, and you might see this already, but I think it's necessary to say, the truth is that the statement doesn't really make sense. Why, Nick? Think, think of what it means to understand something. Think of what has to be true about something for understanding to take place with respect to that thing. Well, this sounds, you know, some things are so obvious that they're, they're so simple that they're obvious and, you know, too obvious to be, well, you know what I mean? <laughs> Obviously, for there to be understanding, there has to be meaning. See? To say that uh, Smith understands long division and Jones does not, you know, presupposes that long division is a real thing distinct from short division, you know, with real meaning, real content, real criteria, real standards, real, right? If there were no standard by which to judge that one type of mathematical procedure was long division and another was not, then it wouldn't make any sense to say that you understand long division. There's not a thing to understand. You can't understand something that has no meaning. In other words, you can't understand something that possesses no innate constraints governing what it is. You see? So when I say the best way to understand critical theory, it's only sort of a way of speaking because the whole point of critical theory is that nothing can be understood. You see? I almost got in a fight once in a bar, or maybe a better way to say it is I almost got punched in the face in a bar uh, by the husband of a couple whose wife was an artist. And uh, is this the time for this story? Maybe this is not the time for this story. Well, maybe you could just fill in the rest. (laughs) The story is just an extension of the same point. Maybe we'll come back to it at some point. Listen, the thing to notice about that, what I said earlier, the, you know, the easiest way to understand critical theory is just what I just said, because the whole point is that there is no, the whole point of critical theory is that there is no neutral vantage point from which you can stand to assess, appraise, or evaluate anything. And I just used a new phrase, neutral value, ne- neutral vantage point. And you might think, but before you're talking about values, well, think about what a universal or objective value would be. It would be a neutral vantage point. If we're all bound to it, then we all stand on it evenly, right? And we all have to assess, you know, what we have to assess in light of it. If it applies to all of us, then it is in fact neutral. So that's what I mean by the whole point of critical theory is that there's no neutral vantage point. There's no objective values by which to assess anything or praise anything, evaluate anything. And therefore, all of those acts of evaluation and theorizing and assessing and analyzing all those things are, are, are um, they're just impositions of one person or group's ideas or ideals upon another. They are, in a word, in Marx's word, oppression. All right? Now, um, here, look, think, think about what this means in terms of history. Just, just to take an example, this is, a great, this is a great book called The Killing of History by Keith Winshuttle. Um, he says, uh, he's referring to these guys and, and sort of the progeny, the offshoots, the sort of academic grandchildren of them. He, he says the newly dominant theorists within the humanities and social sciences assert that it's impossible Now, he's talking about his field of history now. He says, they assert that it's impossible to tell the truth about the past or to use history to produce knowledge in any objective sense at all. They claim that we can only see the past through the perspective of our own culture or group, right? Because that's that's the function of the culture in this this connection. It's just you can only see things through the perspective of of, of your group, your class, as Marx, Marx would say. And hence, he goes on, What we see in history are our own interests and concerns reflected back at us. All right? So, in a sense, it's like projected narcissism. Marxism is projected narcissism. What you're actually seeing is just what you're imposing on the thing because the thing has no standards that apply to it. Well, I think it's partly a a form of narcissism. Yes. It's it's partly a consequence of, of the 
re of the rise of the new rise again of of say Marxist doctrine. I would say it's part of postmodernism. Maybe it's postmodernism more than anything else, because the postmodernists that's a philosophical uh, community. Let's say believe that the entire point of human categorization is power, and that dialogue between people is only a power dialogue, and that there's no real reality outside of interpretation, and that basically what we do is exchange interpretive viewpoints to ratchet up our dominance and status. And that's that. And there's no biology is an ideology, and the idea of the objective world is an ideology, and science is an ideology, and it's all interpretation all the way down, like turtles all the way down. What, what do you mean by it's all about power? Like, in what way? Well, you imagine that that there are groups of people who are competing in the world for resources, I suppose, and that the, it's a zero-sum game, and, and it's every group against every other group. And the reason that we engage in dialogue isn't to establish the truth or move towards some, some closer approximation of reality, but to structure this social interaction so that our group comes up on top. Right. See how this see how this mirrors what Marx said about the haves imposing their values on the have nots by passing them off by passing those values off as universal principles, you know, objective principles and, and, and that means incumbent upon everybody, you know, and therefore, like I said a moment ago, neutral with respect to persons. Remember how Marx and in fact Thrasymachus, you know, thousands of years earlier, see how they wanted you to now believe that all these ideas Justice, liberty, natural rights, and other moral principles, all of them are just constructs, products, fabrications, creations, impositions of an oppressive interplay between social groups. Okay, well, critical theory takes that idea, you know, cooks it on a gas stove in a rusted motorhome, boiling it to a level of, you know, lethal concentration, and then sticks it in in a main artery. These guys essentially realize that if, if Marx is right, then here it is. You got to hear this. I'm not playing around. If Marx is right, I, look, I'm sorry. I, I get into this. I know you thought, oh, ho-hum. I think, I'll, I think I'll listen to this podcast. It's been a while since I put out a podcast. I'll catch up and see, if it's, what, see what he's doing while I ride the bus or run a few miles or clean my apartment or roll a joint or whatever. Right? But listen, whatever you're doing, listen to this. What I'm telling you is like this piece is like the golden key to understanding everything that is sick and twisted and confused and chaotic in our culture these days. This is it. Does that sound like an overstatement? Sorry. This is it. And once you see that clearly, it, I, should, I should apologize. It's going to make you sick, but you'll be inoculated, all right? And you'll start to recognize that the evidence of this kind of sickness everywhere you look because it's 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 endemic it's it's atmospheric but to do that you got to hear this these guys realize that if marx was right about his fundamental idea then this changes everything why does it change everything because then every law every institution every uh holiday every oh oh every statue see everything is in some way fundamentally infected with this oppressive ingredient baked in. And that ingredient is, as we said a few episodes back when we were talking about Marx, what what he called a mode of consciousness that believes that justice and all these principles of morality and so forth and rights, that they're real, unchanging, abiding, objective things by which we can judge other things. When in fact, says Marx, they are just tools of oppression all right what do we have time wise now man i feel like we're just chugging along Jeez, we're almost at an hour man well i gotta keep going here a little bit i guess i guess i'll find a place to, to bring us out but I, we gotta keep going here a little bit so i mean think about this when uh when jefferson writes the declaration of independence you know i mean just think through the implications of this though you know here too for we all thought the guy was really saying that, you know, natural rights of persons inevitably ground the rights of political societies and, and that it was the, the English crown's abuse of those fundamental and natural and objective rights that justified the American Revolution. 
American independence. It turns out now in, in the hands of these guys, their reinterpretation of everything, it turns out, you know, well, if we really knew the truth, as Marx taught us, Jefferson was really just cleverly codifying or codifying a set of ideas that far from being universally right and good really only existed to maintain preserve and increase the material wealth and stature of he and his fellow rich white guys, or as they, as they say these days, rich slave-owning white guys, all right? You see that? All right. This might be, oh, I said we were going to get into critical theory. Now we're at an hour. What do we do? Do we go to another episode? Okay, actually, you know what? I think an hour is enough of your time to ask for. We're going to pick up here in the next episode. Um, I'll leave it off here. So we had said we were going to get into the specifics, some specific strategies and implementations of this sort of general thing that we're calling critical theory here. But we will save that to the next episode. So come back at the top of next episode. We'll continue to move closer to unmasking Antifa. Uh, We are nearing the end of this series. Got a couple more to go here. Uh, My name is Nick. It's the 40 Ounce Hemlock Podcast, and I'll see you next time.